Hello. Um, welcome. My name is Laura Gilbert and I work with students who and their parents um, who are looking at colleges. I'm also um, the author of this book. Let's see if we can get it clear on the screen. Maybe, maybe not. How to Save $50,000 on College. Um, let me give you a little bit, bit of background before I jump into the presentation. Um, I'm a professor in the evenings, um, and I work in a variety of, of areas during the day, uh, mostly related to higher education. Um, I've also been in human resources for a number of years and worked with, with interns. And what I've seen over the years, particularly as a professor and as a parent, is I've seen um, students taking on tremendous amounts of, of debt and other students graduating with very little debt and oftentimes those students come in with the same financial aid package. So I've tried to observe and um, get a sense of what the difference is between those two groups of students. And from, um, from my perspective, um, there appear to be three life skills that really, really help students and families minimize student debt. So let's just jump right in, and anybody can ask questions um, at any time. All right, so let's start with the three skills. The first skill is awareness. I noticed that students who graduate with reasonable debt have a sense of when something's wrong or when something just seems off or when there's an opportunity. So they know where to focus. I've got the little car there because it's kind of like driving. Um, when, you, when you're driving there are so many different things that you could look at but good drivers know when to pay attention to what and they know what to look for. Students who graduate with reasonable debt have that same skill. They know what to pay attention to, um, what to look for, and what to just kind of let let go by so they can they can really focus. Um, they and that means that they notice opportunities that arise and when something like I said when something isn't quite right. The second skill that I've noticed among students who graduate with reasonable debt is they're able to ask. They don't just get overwhelmed by all of the information and everything, else, everything that's going on and assume that they need to just do what they're told, that, they're, that they just need to, to take out more and more debt to um, achieve their goals. Instead, the students who graduate with reasonable debt I see them asking questions. They talk to their professors, they talk to the financial aid officer, they look for, for jobs, they ask maybe for more hours, they check into more work-study opportunities, they um, look for different scholarships or grants that might be new, um, they ask if they can take advanced classes um, that might then um, be able to relate to um, either either their next degree, either a graduate degree, and that's kind of rare. But even in high school, they they will look for classes that um, might they might be able to use for college credit, get college credit for whatever it is. Um, students that graduate with reasonable debt have an ability, have an have an innate ability to to ask. And the third thing that I see, the third skill that I see students that graduate with reasonable debt use all the time is that they have an approach that we used to call living like a student. A lot of the students in the last 10 years and the families have come in with significantly different expectations. Um, in 2002 to 2004, I was on a parent committee at a college out east and um, uh, the financial aid officer and the president of that college um, shared with the parent committee that things had really shifted in that year. The incoming freshmen that year and their families had very different expectations. They expected the school to have um, state-of-the-art equipment all of the time. They expected the school to have state-of-the-art uh, facilities in terms of, of um, health not health care but a wellness facilities gyms that sort of thing and they also expected state-of-the-art dorms where students um, many families expected and students expected the um, there to be enough room in their dorm or the option for a private room right away um, where they could put a small couch they you know could have their television and they could just have all sorts of things all of those things cost money and when the schools um, add all of the, those different buildings, it costs them money also. And so one of the things that's kind of happened over these last 10 years is there's been a shift 
from students really trying to live like a student to students living, wanting to live more in, as I, as I call it, the manner to which they've grown accustomed, the, making home, making their dorm room home. Marketers have just gone crazy with all of this. I'm sure many of you have seen lists from different, different companies, whether it's Target or um, the Container Store or Lowe's or wherever it is, um, lists that say, here is your list of college essentials. And literally looking at any of those lists, most of those things aren't essential for college. But a lot of parents and students will look at those lists and go, oh, I must need that. So suddenly, more and more money starts starts going out, and with it, the expectations of of many uh, many additional things. The other thing with approach is, oftentimes students have gotten into a into a focus where and and with families where we need to to get in order to reach this goal, there is one path to get there, and in reality, there are many many different paths. I compare it to climbing a mountain. You, if you want to climb a mountain, there are, I am sure, some incredibly expensive boots that you can, you can purchase. At the same time, there are other boots that are available that are not cheap, but they're not as expensive as the, the state-of-the-art um, sort of boots. Each climber can still get there. Each person can still get there. And students who graduate with reasonable debt look at, at their options. They might start at a community college or they might look again at, at um, classes that they can transfer in. Um, they, they just, they, they look at their options and they're, they're flexible. And when they do make decisions, they act with intention and they realize that the choice is theirs. So now, let's look at three areas where students tend to, who graduate with reasonable debt, really apply these, these skills. All right, and I actually have this little uh, college cost wheel on a on a business card. If anybody sends me an email with your address, I'm more than happy um, to mail this to you. And I've got some other resources I'll talk about at the end, and I'm more than happy to send you copies of those. Um, anyway, so I put together this. I call it the college cost wheel, and it's there are three categories, and these are the three categories where I see students graduate with reasonable debt where they really pay attention. And there are some, some very simple things that they do with, with in these three areas. There are eight basic cost categories for college. This is not news. But um, students and families who graduate with reasonable debt are aware of the basic costs. They're aware of those eight categories. And when they're looking at their costs for a particular school, they make sure that they've budgeted in each of those categories. Second, when they're signing documents for loans or even to receive grants, scholarships, that sort of thing, students who graduate with reasonable debt are aware of what they're signing. They understand when they're signing for a loan that's, say, a federal loan as opposed to a private loan. They, they don't necessarily need to know all of the details. They don't need to, to walk in freshman year as, as attorneys or, or tax experts. But they do need to just have that basic sense of is this what is this that I'm signing? Is this a federal loan? Is it a private loan? Is it a grant? Is there what what is my commitment on the other side? And then families that, that have students who graduate with reasonable debt tend to set a debt target. Freshman year are walking in, they have a sense in their mind, they have an idea of what the maximum amount is that the student is going to borrow for that degree. Unfortunately, many students don't think about this, and then they're surprised at the end. Families are surprised at the very end when suddenly they're looking at all of these loans that they've taken out. Right now, the average debt um, from a number of different sources, basically any source you look at is going to give you a slightly different number, but the average student loan debt, as advertised right now, um, is about $27,000. However, that doesn't include parent loans, and sometimes that doesn't include private loans. So 
that anyway, that's just a, a little tidbit there. So the third thing is that is to know what your reasonable debt target is, and we'll talk about how to get there. If if it's overwhelming to think about that piece, figuring out the reasonable debt target, if the student only, here's a shortcut, if the student only takes out federal loans, they will be around $30,000. Right now, the maximum for an undergraduate degree is $31,000 if they take five years, or it's about $27,000 if they um, do a four-year undergraduate degree. And right now, that is a pretty reasonable maximum amount. The um, depending on a bunch of other things, but still, overall, if you just want to cut to the chase and and have a number, 30,000 or federal loans, only take out federal loans and you should be fine. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Now, the students and families that are, that are really suffering are those that have taken out many additional loans, um, and even for state colleges, end up with sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in debt, um, and that's that's where the real problem lies. So let's let's dig in here for a minute. So first we're going to look oops see if I can get to the next slide here. There we go. So first we're going to look at the eight expense categories. And again, this isn't this is not new, but I'm going to walk through them just quickly um, and share some things that you might not know. <clears throat> so tuition Everybody knows that there is a sticker price um, for tuition. That's the advertised price. But then there's also your price. And how much tuition an individual student or family pays is dependent on many, many things. There is a, a financial aid form called the FAFSA that um, families must fill out in order to, to qualify um, for any financial aid. Um, a lot of times student uh, schools will offer, offer grants sometimes also referred to as, as discounts on tuition, but they're, they're grants toward tuition um, based on, on the financial aid, that financial aid form, which considers family resources, considers other children that you might have, and considers a bunch of different things. But there are a number of different factors that go into that um, also, um, and the school will decide that. Fees. Oftentimes, the advertised dollar figure um, for tuition will say tuition and fees. But I encourage families to look closely when they get the, the bill, um, to look closely at what those fees are, because occasionally some of those are optional. And it might be a $20 optional fee for a, a student journal or something. But if you don't need that, if your student doesn't need that, um, you can waive that. Uh, the biggest place where I've seen some families with some schools um, run into some um, extra expenses underneath fees that they didn't need to pay is with insurance. If your student is already on your policy, make sure that you're not paying double by paying for additional um, insurance through the college. Now there might be a different type of insurance that the college is including in the fees, but just make sure that, that take, a, take a quick peek when you get the bill and make sure that you understand that you're not paying for identical insurance twice. Room and board. I think that the um, the biggest place where I see students overspending here is again either um, trying to to do um, get the fancy room, whether it's and that's oftentimes an off-campus place, and sometimes it appears that that's going to be less expensive. However, oftentimes students will forget that if you rent an apartment, um, there is a security deposit. There is um, uh, maybe heat, electricity, um, cable, internet, um, you're buying and cooking all of your own food, very different. So, so be sure to, to sort of take all of those things into account um, when you're looking at room. And this, the, the uh, place where I see students um, overspend with board, which is generally the meal plan, is oftentimes students will take out or families will, will take out a meal plan for the student, but then the student eats other places. And so, in essence, they're, they're doubling their expenses. Books, supplies, transportation, personal expenses, um, those, those vary depending on your major. Those vary depending on the, on the school. And there are more and more and more opportunities to watch costs there. And again, students that use those three life skills, they're aware of, 
um, which books are optional, which books are are you know, recommended, and which books are essential. Um, they're aware of of places where they can buy books um, for a discount, whether it's uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble. Both of those those companies um, offer textbooks at greatly reduced discounts. Um, used textbooks, things like that. Anyway, um, but I'm going to take a, a minute on personal expenses because. Generally, colleges will say personal expenses, um, you should allow a certain amount of money for personal expenses. However, a lot of times that's where students end up spending um, student loan dollars that um, really should be going other places, and then they end up taking out more and more and more. Um, so generally, the colleges define personal expenses as toiletries, basic clothes, you know, a couple of pairs of jeans, that sweatshirt, that kind of a thing, basic supplies, and an occasional pizza. But a few years ago, there was a um, a program um, on cable called Pimp Your Dorm, <laughs> and the personal expenses really were significantly higher than most colleges allow for. So here's the here are some examples of uh, the dorm room makeover. And it isn't that these things are bad by any means, but it, this is all about awareness. And if um, families or the students are going to spend a lot of money in these areas, just be sure that you've budgeted for that so you don't get, get caught um, surprised with a, a tuition bill or something that then you need to borrow more money to, for. So just be aware. Um, I suggest to students in high school what they can do is just start to notice how much they're spending and what they really need. Was this something that they really needed or was this something that was, you know, was fun but they could live without? Um, and then, then start to be aware of the, the marketers. Start to be aware of the, the ads when the ads are saying, you must have this. And just pause and think, do I really need that? Do I really need that? So again, these are, these are life skills. There are even, I, I'll just point out, there are some luxury student housing, um, uh, like apartment complexes that are starting to go up around the country um, near different campuses just because there is such a, a push for this sort of thing. All right. So let's move on. Um, we're going to look at one example. I happen to live in Minnesota, and so I've used two Minnesota schools here, but you can plug any school into into this chart. Um, what I've done is here are the eight the eight cost categories, the eight expense categories, and then average costs, the tuition costs that I have in here are from Minnesota, but other than that um, these are national figures. And um, so let's look at two schools. They're both music schools. One is more of a traditional um, private college that um, is known for music, and the other is a fairly new school um, that happens to be a for-profit school, um, but it's getting a lot of national recognition as more of a contemporary music school. <clears throat> in fact, for example, they have the only hip-hop studies program in the country with some really cool and interesting people. Two different programs, but let's just take a quick look at, at um, how to think through this, things to be aware of. So these are actual advertised costs um, from the websites of, of each of these programs. So tuition at St. Olaf, tuition at McNally, yeah, it's, it's very different. Um, but now let's look at fees. Well, St. Olaf just says the fees are included within the tuition, so I'd want to ask what the fees are. Now the fees at McNally Smith are pretty high, they're 3500 um, which seems a little steep to me, so I would want to understand what's in there. We compare room and board, that's about the same. Um, books and supplies, both schools say that books and supplies um, should cost about $1,000 a year. Um, the national average is $1,200. That's in the ballpark. Neither school has anything for supplies, and supplies might be a computer, uh, you know, a laptop that the, that the student needs, supplies um, used to be pencils and paper, still might need some pencils and paper, and supplies would include um, things like 
a stethoscope if your student is in a nursing class or, or something like that, but special or art supplies. And if your student is a, is a music major, supplies could include their instrument. I know a lot of times when students enter college as a music student, they need a, a new instrument, a more professional level instrument. So for you, that you might want to put more money in there. And right now, neither of the schools has anything in there. Now let's take a quick look at the personal expenses. St. Olaf says $900. The national average is $1,900. So that feels a little low to me, but, <clears throat> but you know, maybe. But McNally Smith has $5,842, they say, for personal expenses. And to go right to the next column, transportation also. McNally Smith has 2060 Now, I haven't talked to them, but I'm guessing, just based on my understanding of, of um, th their programs, my guess is that there might be money in there for concert tickets because since they're looking at contemporary music, my guess is that these students are probably expected to go to um, a, a number of concerts just to understand um, what contemporary music is, is doing. So that's just my guess. But if I were a student looking at these budgets, I would want to understand what was in there. And then finally, um, there is uh, St. Olaf offers nothing for transportation. Now, St. Olaf happens to be in a rural community and students are walking to campus. But still, students have to get there somehow and they have to go home during breaks. Um, so I think that, that um, I would definitely want to, um, want to add something in there, especially if you're coming from far away. So I've got a question here that I'm going to answer right away. The question is, is it possible to get copies of the slides? Um, the connection was not active for the last 15 minutes um, for U.S. overseas. And the answer is, I, my assumption is absolutely. Um, I'm not sure how it works on College Week Live, but at the very end, um, I'll give you my, my email address, and I can give it to you right now, too. It's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at Back to School for Grownups, which was my first book. Back to School for Grownups dot com. Um, send me an email, and I'm happy to send you um, the slides. So now, moving on. So now you've looked through, and the family has looked through these eight categories. You've maybe done some comparison. I could anybody that's interested too. I can send you um, a blank sheet with the the average costs, um, a blank sheet like this that's on the screen right now, so that you can fill in your own colleges as your student is looking, so that they can start to compare costs and make sure that they've they've thought through those eight different categories. So now, um, how do you pay? There are four ways to pay for college. I break it into four ways. Different other, other authors will, will look at it slightly differently. First is cash and savings. And I define that as money that you have right now, not money that you're going to save over the next year um, while the student is in school, for example, but money that you have right now. Um, the second is income, which is pay as you earn. A number of, of schools will offer um, payment plans for families that are typically based on a 10-month on a payment plan. How those plans are set up varies by uh, school, so you'll definitely want to talk to the financial aid in, uh, individuals to, to find out if that exists and what the, um, how their plan, plan works. Other times, students um, well, students also may have a regular job on campus, or they may have a work-study position, which I note here is, is not guaranteed. A lot of times families assume that if a student receives a work-study award, that they, they automatically get that money, and then they just have to put in so many hours over the year. It's not how it works. A work-study um, work award simply means that the student has the right to apply for a work-study position on campus and if they do apply and they do they are accepted into into that job um, and they do work the hours then they can earn up to a certain amount of money third scholarships and grants and there are a lot of different types of scholarships and grants um, I sort of subcategory these as awards and discounts the thing to know is that um, scholarships that are outside scholarships not connected to the school can affect at least somewhat the amount of grant money that you get. 
also um, scholarships, the way that outside scholarships, private scholarships, are, are awarded um, varies a lot. I've been on a number of committees that um, awarded scholarships and I've seen a variety of, of different methods. And what I tell students is that if you're applying for outside scholarships, the, the Coca-Cola scholarship, the Mensa scholarship, the uh, Rotary, a Rotary scholarship, a church-related scholarship, if you apply for a scholarship and you don't receive it, don't feel bad. Sometimes one of the scholarships that I, um, where I was on the committee, we received over 12,000, 12,000 applicants for three scholarships. So anyway, I just want, want to make sure that, that students are so stressed during this, this whole process. Um, and so I, I just, I caution, caution students about spending a ton of time looking for external scholarships, applying for external scholarships. Um, anyway, we can talk about that more if anybody has any questions, but I'm going to jump ahead. And then loans, and this is really what the topic of today connects to, is um, making sure that you're not taking out too many loans. So let's jump over here. So there are basically, and again, this is sort of how I categorize the loans, but there are basically four types of loans. There are federal loans, which we'll talk about um, more in a, in a second. There are state loans. In Minnesota, There's it's called the self-loan. Um, but that loan in particular needs a creditworthy co-signer. So that means a parent is co-signing. Um, and so that, that loan is then jointly owned by the student and the parent. And if the parent needs to buy a new car and, and um, get financing for that, or for any other reason needs to take out a, a, another loan, the fact that they have co-signed for that student's loan will be considered. Um, so I always caution parents about um, really thinking through um, their own needs before they co-sign for a student loan. Um, third kind is private loans, and that's where a lot of the problem has happened over the last few years. And just in case um, anybody hasn't, hasn't heard this statistic, we're now about a trillion dollars. Uh, in the United States, we have about a trillion dollars in, in student loan debt. Um, and there are, there are many, many concerns about that. Um, in that, uh, of that trillion dollars, about $155 billion is currently held by parents and grandparents. Not only does this affect what parents and grandparents can, can get when they need to take out a loan for something like health care or, you know, or the, the roof falls in you know, on their house or a new car or something like that, but it also, from um, a much broader perspective, um, affects society because rather than being able to, to um, pay for new clothes or, or you know, something else, um, different different other expenses, people are really being strapped by those student loans, especially the private student loans. So be very, very careful about taking those out. And they're generally um, either higher um, interest rates, sometimes they're lower initially, but they might go up. So um, very, very cautious about private loans. And then the fourth category is personal loans. And I've seen more and more students um, doing paperwork, doing professional paperwork, having somebody um, sort of really create paperwork um, as though they were um, taking a loan from a bank, but instead taking it from a parent or taking it from um, a, different, a different relative. Um, and this is, just, this, is, this is just something that we're seeing more and more. Okay, back to federal loans. Federal loans are available to almost everybody, not everybody almost everybody. And they're sometimes called direct loans. They're also known as Stafford loans. And there are three types of them. There are Stafford subsidized, Stafford unsubsidized, and Perkins loans. So when you hear, for today, I'm not going to dig into all of the details about those three different types of federal loans. We're just going to talk about federal loans in general and why federal loans are good. So the good news about federal loans is that, first of all, they have decent fixed interest rates. The interest rate, once you take out that loan, does not change. 
The most important thing, though, is that there are healthy loan limits. Like I mentioned earlier, the maximum you can take out for as an undergraduate right now in federal loans is about 31000 for five years. For four years, it's about $27,000. If I, if I look at a number in between there and say, let's say the student takes out $30,000, $30,000 in federal loans, at 6.8% interest, which is the current rate, for 10 years, those payments are $345 a month. That's not fun, and it's not easy, but it's doable. It is definitely doable. The families that are in students that are getting into trouble are the ones that have taken out 60, 70, 80, 100 thousand dollars in debt for an undergraduate degree. And then if they can't find a job, now they've got a thousand dollar loan payment and they're in, in deep trouble. So if you only take out federal loans, your student loan payment will be about $345 a month or less. So that's really good news. The other really important thing to know about federal loans is that there are many, many options for repayment. If you go back to school, if you're in the military, you get deployed, if you lose your job, have a health issue, any of those things, there are options for forbearance or deferment. And again, I'm not going to go into great detail right now um, on what those two different um, types of repayment are, but it means that you can basically press pause on your payment schedule without being considered in default or anything like that. So, um, let's see, I see another question here. I'll take that in just a second. Um, the other thing with federal loans is with federal loans, you can consolidate them, meaning you can pull them all together and end up with a lower payment. Um, there are a variety of new repayment plans, uh, some based on, on your income. So if the student has um, takes a job in, say, the nonprofit sector or, or someplace where they're getting less pay, um, they can sign up for one of the income-based repayment plans where they can pay the loan over a longer period of time for less. Um, and then there are more and more forgiveness programs. Um, for example, teachers who are working in specific um, inner city areas and a lot of different um, professions. Um, check into forgiveness programs if you're going into any public service um, areas, but those only apply to federal loans. So I'm before uh, we go on, I'm going to take this next question. So this question is, if a college tells you the other expenses are $2,120, how is that charged? Um, if the, well, if the college says other expenses, I would ask what those expenses are and how they're going to be charged. Because at this point, if all they've said is other expenses, you don't know. Um, and rather than just getting that on a bill, I would want to know, especially, you know, if it was other expenses, $5, and it came on the bill, then I would just let it go. Um, but that's me. But $2,120, I'd want to know what other expenses were. So I don't know if that's a, a helpful answer to you, but I would ask, I would definitely, definitely ask what they are and how they're charged. So let's see. So now um, we've looked at a, at a few things and um, how to identify what is the, that reasonable student loan, that debt target um, for you. Now this is going to depend on your family, your resources, the college that you attend, and I'll, I'll, let me specify, um, talk a little bit about that. Um, I was I gave a presentation last night and one of the students is looking at uh, possibly looking at music school and so we talked about well if she had her college budget but then she got into Juilliard you know which is a, a t absolute top music school and let's say that the financial aid package that Juilliard offered her was five thousand dollars short of her the, the budget that she and her family came up with for Juilliard it might be worth it. On the other hand, um, had she gotten into some school without without Juilliard's reputation and her family needed to come up with $5,000 extra beyond their budget, 
So you might want to consider um, looking looking for other places because a lesser school might not might not be worth it. But it's completely that is a a decision that uh, is completely family based. So um, degree and major. If you're looking at at engineering and you're at um, say Massachusetts Institute of Technology. A reasonable student loan debt target might be higher than if you're an, um, an art major at um, a local state college and you're hoping um, to maybe um, make it as, a, as an artist, not necessarily as an art teacher, but as, as an artist. And the reason that I say that is that um, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want your life to be defined by the loan payments that you're burdened by. So if you're looking at, if a student is looking at going into a field that where jobs are very scarce or jobs pay less, I really encourage them to take out as little debt as is humanly possible just so they don't have that burden later on. And it will really help them as they try to um, try to really move into that, in this example, in, in this area of, of art. Um, otherwise, if they've got all of the stress of the student loans, too, um, it can really affect their, their ability to move forward. The economy, um, unexpected things, things that ha might happen while the student's in school. Um, plans for additional education. Um, you don't definitely don't want to um, take out $60,000 in an undergraduate degree um, if you're thinking about then moving forward to graduate school. So um, vision for early adult life, car, house, family, travel, those sorts of things. If the student loan payments are too high, it's really affecting how um, young people can even move out of their parents' home. So, And then tolerance for long-term debt. Now, all of this takes a lot of time and, and effort for families to, to, to figure out. So again, it, in the end, it's a guess. So if that's just overwhelming, what I recommend, as I said earlier, is just stick with the federal loans. Um, and again, going back to those life skills, that's why it's so important. Students who um, graduate with reasonable debt, they don't necessarily know what everything that's behind a federal loan, but they know to ask, is this a federal loan or is this a different type of loan? And they know to, to try to figure out how to budget so that they stick within those federal loan limits. And here are just a few reasons that, that I've mentioned earlier too. Um, uh, this is a reasonable debt load. Um, it's about $30,000 or $345 a month for 10 years at the current rates. It's also about the average debt for new graduates. Um, it's close to the average annual salary for somebody who's employed in the United States right now. And that's not people who, um, that's not a new grad salaries, but it's sort of the average annual salary, which is in the, the low 30s. So. And again, the federal loans include all of these options. So now, in summary, and then we can just go to more questions. So to graduate with reasonable debt, um, be aware of the basics. Plan for costs in each of those eight categories. Notice and ask when something is missing. Um, know what type of loans you're signing for and have that maximum debt target. Students should have that debt target and um, parents should have that debt target and always, always, always track your balance. Um, ask questions. Ask about everything. Ask what costs are mandatory or optional. Ask what, ask what new options might exist um, for work study options or for um, loans or grants or other, other sources of, of um, income um, and ask questions that just that cross your mind over time and then take a flexible approach um, be open to reasonable sacrifices to, to meet your goals and really try to live like a student so I've got two more slides and then we'll jump to the rest of the questions <clears throat> so this is extra credit and I just add this again because of um, the student loan uh, challenge that we've got as, as a country right now and as individuals. So the student loans are your debt. When a student signs for them, they're the student's debt, which is is kind of mind-boggling because these are, at, at the beginning, 17 and 18 year olds who are signing for thousands upon thousands of dollars of debt that they are expected to pay off over a period of a, of a decade or more 
And at that point, a 17 or 18 year old might not have even had a checking account, which many people don't even, you know, balance a check checkbook anymore. But still, they might have done not done online banking. They might have never had a budget. It's pretty rare that a 17 or 18 year old has that kind of um, savvy. But it's really important to know those are your that's your debt as a student, and your signature is legally binding. Another thing to know is when colleges say we meet your full need, your full financial need, that doesn't mean they're going to give, give it all to you in scholarships and grants. But it does mean that they'll help you find loans. Again, pay attention. Um, the school's responsibility to remember that their responsibility is to provide you with the education that they have advertised. It's your responsibility to be a reasonable bor borrower. So, and then the loan balance and payment history will be considered um, in the future when the student or a parent who is co-signed looks at, at other, other loans. And student loans must be paid. They don't go away in bankruptcy, and there's a, a number of, of lawsuits out right now um, where a, a terrible tragedy has occur, occurred and the, the student has died, and now there are all of these loans. Federal loans go away if something like that happens. Private loans do not. And if a parent has co-signed for a private loan, the parent is oftentimes stuck with that burden while they're grieving this poor student. So anyway, be aware this is, um, loans are definitely something to, to think about before signing. So my last little quick si slide here is um, um, the three books, my three books that, that I've written. The one that um, I'm sort of speaking to today is the How to Save $50,000 on College. These are all available on Amazon. They're also available for Kindle. Um, and about once every three or four months, I offer them for free on Kindle. Um, so you can always keep your eye out for that. Otherwise, the, the two, um, the How to Save 50000 on College and Graduate School on a Budget are $9.95 on uh, Kindle. And Back to School for Grown Ups is $16.95. So. Anyway, um, and here is all of my information. Um, and if you can't find the slides, if you can't get the slides, or if you'd like my the little business card, I'll hold it up here, see if it, yep, it's just too bright in here. Anyway, with the little, it's got the little uh, cost wheel on it, and it's got the three life skills in the back. Um, I can send that to you. I also have um, a page on how to sit down, how parents can sit down with their students and talk about money for college. Talk about, um, sort of open the, the discussion and how they can keep that open. So just let me know what, what you'd like and I can email that to you. So let's see. Um, first question here. Um, what's the average debt for a four-year university? Um, for a four-year college, the debt is about $27,000 right now. That's the, the average student loan debt. Student loan debt, again, doesn't count, doesn't count uh, parent debt. However, um, the average, let me just grab, excuse me, I'm gonna grab something quick here. That's um, interesting, I think. Um, the average cost the average cost, and that's different from the, from your debt, but the average cost of two-year community colleges, and again, these are Minnesota numbers, um, but it's pretty common in most states. So the average cost of a two-year community college is $5,373. This is tuition and fees, just to be clear. So you need to look at what's in those other six categories, but tuition and fees, $5,373 dollars. Um, private career colleges in Minnesota, $14,000. Now we get to the four-year colleges. So to get to your question, you say a four-year university, a state university um, in Minnesota is about $7,681. The University of Minnesota, however, um, is significantly more for um, in-state tuition is $13,620. But our other state universities, again, are about 7,600. And then private colleges and universities that might be a McAllister, a St. Thomas, St. Kate's, um, something like that, um, are about 34,000. But many of them are more. There are some that are less. Many of them are more. Um, 
two websites that are phenomenal that where you can find a lot of really helpful information. Um, one is FinAid, F-I-N-A-I-D dot org, and there is just a significant amount of very reliable, good information on there. The other one is collegeboard.org. Again, collegeboard.org. One of the new things that um, colleges are now required to do is colleges are required to have a net price calculator on their website. For a lot of colleges, um, for one reason or other, they rather than having it exactly on their their website, they have um, it's available through collegeboard.org. So if you go to collegeboard.org and um, search for net price calculator, and this might be the best information you get from the presentation today, um, you can then look up the school that you're considering, click on that school. It will ask you a bunch of questions that are similar to questions on the FAFSA, but not nearly as detailed, and they'll ask you some different ones. And based on actual grants and awards, grants and scholarships, all of that, that the school has given in the last few years, you will get some, you will get information, you will get an estimate on if your student went to that was accepted at that school, what your price would be how much you would get receive in grants and scholarships, how much you would get your student would be likely to get in work study funds, um, the types of loans that they would be expecting you to pay, all of that. It's wonderful. Net price calculators. And the, the website is, um, again, is collegeboard.org. But again, you can, if you're on a college's website, and uh, uh, definitely search on the college website also for net price calculator. Okay, so next question: um, the school that my the schools my daughter is applying to are about fifty-two thousand dollars a year total, or over two hundred thousand dollars for four years, which is exactly why I wrote this book because <laughs> people were saying, "Yes, it's two hundred thousand dollars." I'm thinking, "No, no, no, you can you can cut that down." So how does that come down to? only owing 30000 on graduation. Do most students get substantial grants from the schools? Okay, all of this depends on a bunch of things. First of all, the family's income. For example, I spoke to a family um, recently whose two daughters, twins, um, were National Merit Scholars. They received full scholarships at many schools, including some of these schools that cost $52,000 a year. However, Neither of the daughters wanted to go to any of those schools. They wanted to go to different schools, and the schools that they wanted to go to did not offer them money based on, they only, they only offered money based on need, and this family was very well off. So the family ended up spending $250,000 cash um, to send their daughters to the schools that the daughters wanted to attend, even though the, the students could have gone for free someplace else. So my point with that story is if you have the resources, if you're a family that's, who's very well off, then the schools are going to ask you to pay. And they're, um, but then there wouldn't be, you wouldn't be taking out loans, so there wouldn't be that question of how does it come down to only owing $30,000 upon graduation. Now, on the other hand, if your family has um, more of, if you're more of a middle class family or um, a family that even has less money than, than an average mi middle class family, yes, the schools are giving out tremendous amounts of grants. And the best way to see what, um, what you might be asked to pay is take those schools that um, your daughter is applying to that are about $52,000 a year and go to the collegeboard.org, look them up in there, run through their net, the net price calculator for each of those schools, and, and that will give you an idea of which schools are most likely to give you substantial grants and what they're going to expect you and your daughter to take out, particularly your daughter, to take out in, in loans. Net price calculators at collegeboard.org best thing that's happened in the last few years around all of this college stuff. So, okay. And the next question that I have here is, does the name of the school actually matter to employers? For example, the University of Florida compared to the University of Akron. Great question. 
Great question. And having been in human resources and sorted through, I don't even know how many tens of thousands of, of resumes over the years. Um, I can definitely respond to that. The first, the first thing to know is if your student is going to be, let me back up, it matters if, if where you want to sell that degree, they care. So for example, there used to be some fast track um, management programs at some of the big um, companies, Clorox, Pepsi, General Mills, um, I don't remember where else, but anyway, and a lot of those um, programs really targeted, they didn't necessarily advertise this, but they really targeted a few schools, a handful of colleges. If the student had graduated from someplace else, it was less likely that they would get an interview for those positions. Now, on the other hand, if we're talking about just normal jobs, just normal traditional jobs, what I what I recommend is I think that um, well, I recommend that people are very cautious about going to for-profit colleges. Um, if they have an option to go to a not-for-profit not school, a private school, or a state school. Um, state schools and a private schools um, are schools that employers understand, whereas the for-profit schools have gotten um, so much flack in the news, and some of them are very good, and some of them are not at all. And employers haven't figured out how to, how to sort through that yet. So one of the things that I see is if you've graduated from a school that um, an employer has heard of or can imagine. So I think in this question, um, yes, in this question, um, the individual who asked this said University of Florida or University of Akron. Employers have heard of both of those. So now the other thing that I would say specific to these two schools, whether you go to one school um, or the other, if there is a special program, I know somewhere in Florida, I don't believe it's the University of Florida, but somewhere in, in, in Florida, there's a special program related to um, car repair that is for like BMWs and all of the fancy European cars. It's a very, very exclusive program that's part of some school in, in Florida. If that's the job that, that your student wants to get and they can get into that program, then it will make a difference if they go there rather than an auto repair program at a different school. So that's just an example. I hope that's, that's helpful. All right, so next question. Uh, my son is in Georgia and wants to go to out-of-state schools. Does it make sense to pay out-of-state tuition for an engineer major? Boy, that, that goes back to that whole family, um, family budget and, and thinking through um, for your student. In Minnesota, we have a number of reciprocity programs. So for example, um, my students, my kids could go to Wisconsin and pay in-state tuition. Um, another resource, a resource for you to look at is, um, I believe every state has an Office of Higher Education. Check out and see, um, Try to contact the Office of Higher Education in Georgia and find out if they have reciprocity with any of the state institutions that um, that your student is any of the states. I'm sorry, any of the states that your that your student is interested in. Sometimes it's even 10% off, um, but it can be you know significantly. It can be tens of thousands of dollars. The other thing that I would say is have the student apply. Definitely have the student apply. You never know. You just never know what types of grants um, and scholarships they, they might receive. Um, for example, um, I worked with a student a while ago who had fine grades and you know a fine profile and all of that and was looking at an out-of-state school and she did a, a college tour and, and interviewed and during the interview the interviewer was very kind and kind of said you know, yes we understand that you know here you've got decent grade all of that um, but I noticed that you also play bassoon and our first chair bassoon player is leaving this year this was not a music major. This student was looking at, um, I think, journalism or communication. Completely different major. Had no intent on continuing her music in college. But the interviewer said, "Would you be? Would you consider? Would you consider that?" 
Um, and she ended, you know, she said yes, she committed to being in one, uh, one musical ensemble a year and got accepted, got um, some scholarship funds. So you just don't know. Go ahead and apply. Go ahead and apply and see what, see what happens and then talk about it as a, as a family. So let's see. Ooh, I've only got six minutes. Got a few questions here. Okay, so the next individual says, we own our own business and earn a significant amount of money now. However, when we started five years ago, we had to borrow quite a bit of money um, and uh, ran up the debt. We're still paying that today, even though our income shows that we earn a lot. If I didn't have to pay back those loans, I'd have more money <clears throat> freed up. Um, it doesn't seem... Um, I'm sorry, it ran off the... Oh, that the net price calculator takes debts and loans into calculation. Is there a way to address this with the colleges? Yes, it's called the special circumstances letter. Absolutely. The other thing that I would do is when you look at colleges, once you have um, your the college, uh, once you've narrowed down the colleges that your student is very interested in, um, talk to them, visit them, sit down with them, and explain your situation, and then write a special circumstances letter. Um, that can help out a tremendous amount, but definitely um, talk to people, talk to the financial aid director. So, okay, um, I have somebody who says he's a lecturer in uh, management sciences in a public university in Pakistan. Um, and he's asking for what what recommend what institution I would recommend um, for admission to a PhD program. I'm really sorry, but that's not something that I can really um, help you with. Um, I guess just offhand, just personal experience, I look at MIT uh, because MIT is is phenomenal. They have a phenomenal management science program, um, and they're known internationally. So that's that's my just a, a personal opinion. There are there I think is a Georgia Tech. There are some other um, programs that are uh, that compete with with MIT, um, and sometimes those those the programs that compete with MIT can offer um, more opportunities for international students. So um, anyway, um, but I'd start there and then check around. So the last question that I have here is, if both options are still within the budget, is, is it worth going away to school? Ah, I see, for the full experience, as opposed to living at home and commuting to save money. I'd say it really depends on the student. Some students, uh, for some students, moving away um, is, is really a good thing. On the other hand, um, if they can stay at home um, for the first year and commute to school and just, you know, spend a lot of their time on the campus maybe, but um, and save a bunch of money. You might be able to that that could be money that could either fund you know a used car or graduate school part of graduate school or something like that. So I think it's a wonderful question. It's a really good question, and it's a good question to sit down and and really explore with the student um, and help them understand that that money is finite. Here is the budget. Here is the pot of money. Um, that we have to to help with your school and let's talk about how that money is going to be spent whether it's going to be spent um, by allowing you to go and you know, live on campus three states away which also by the way way then you need to think about the transportation costs back and forth that sort of thing um, or maybe taking the first year or so um, and doing that locally and then transferring um, which is more and more of an option at, at, at schools. So we have um, only two minutes left. Oh, I see uh, one more question. So do you save more going to a two-year community college and then transferring to university to finish your bachelor's? Yes! <laughs> By going to a two-year community college and then transferring to a university it, or transferring even to a private school, you can save. You can save up to $50,000 just by doing that off of that total of $200,000. But again, the community and the community colleges, I don't think I mentioned um, in this presentation yet, but um, have changed dramatically over the years. Um, 20 years ago, um, community colleges were often places where students who weren't quite ready to move away from home or weren't quite ready for uh, college level work went um, to, to get ready. Today, um, you can, no matter what you want to do, no matter where you want to go, there are, there are tough, 
tough classes at community colleges and there are phenomenal professors. There has been a glut of professors in the market because a number of, of professors have continued teaching way beyond typical retirement age. And so a lot of the young professors coming up are finding it almost impossible to find um, a teaching job in a university. A lot of those people are going to community colleges to teach. They're, they're vibrant. Uh, and some of the older, older professors um, are people who were in the workplace for a while, and now they're, they're uh, at the community college. Definitely, definitely, no matter who your student is and what they're looking at, at least consider, at least consider your local community colleges or even community colleges in either state. About 400 community colleges in the country right now also have dorms. Um, they're expanding, they're changing. So um, our time is up, but again, my uh, information is on the screen. Feel free to send me an email um, anytime and I will respond. Thank you so much for coming today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you.